Okay, Mayor, I will turn it over to you. Good evening and welcome to the March 25th, 2021 meeting of the Citrusite City Council. Earlier this evening, we met in closed session and there's no reportable action. And with that, I'd ask Amy to put the uh, flag up. And if you'd unmute yourselves, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance <throat> to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of America and to the, to the Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under, God, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice indivisible. for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Would you please call the roll, Ms. Van? Councilmember Bruins? Present. Councilmember Daniels? Here. Councilmember Schaefer? Here. Vice Mayor Middleton? Present. And Mayor Miller? Here. Tonight's meeting of the Citrusite City Council is brought cablecast live on Metro Cable Channel 14 to the gov Local Government Affairs Channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse Cable Systems. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at citrusheights.net. Tonight's meeting replays on Sunday, March 28th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. And this meeting can also be viewed on the City of Citrus Heights YouTube channel. Thank you, Amy. With that, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the agenda. I move we approve the agenda. Second. Motion by Bruins, <laughs> second by, I think, Daniels. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton. Aye. Mayor Miller. Aye. And with that, let's move on to the uh, first item. The first item is presentation number four, a presentation by the Sunrise Marketplace on their annual report. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, hi, Kathleen. Hi, Steve. How are you? Good to I'm see good. you guys. Haven't seen some of you in a long time. I'm just here to give the report. Everyone got a copy of it, so I'm not going to, you know, go over it in any detail. Um, as you probably saw in the report, we spent much of 2020 the same as you guys, um, you know, dealing with COVID. <laughs> and providing relief for our businesses. We spent about $50,000 on um, relief for our businesses in the district on PPE, sneeze guard, signage, floor decals, pretty much anything anyone needed, some very customized assistance, but whatever our folks needed, we you know tried to get it out to them. And we also, as I'm sure you know, spent a great deal of time on uh, beginning the renewal of the PBID, which as you know, does expire this year. So we spent some amount of time on that. And to date, we spent about $126,000 on um, renewing the PBID. Um, and that's um, a little more than usual, um, but not too bad, fairly normal. Um, and of course, one of the big things we did is we added security last year. Um, and as we move forward, you're going to see us focus a bit more on the sort of clean and safe uh, aspects of the bid. Some of you were here uh, when we formed the bid many uh, 20 years ago. And of course it was really a primarily a marketing bid. Um, when we looked around and we said, gee, it's pretty safe and it's pretty clean. Um, you know, what are we gonna do here? And it was really about destination building marketing, creating awareness for the city and the district uh, and drawing traffic, you know, through special events. But what we've seen uh, in this past year, and of course, it's not just us, um, many seated cities are seeing an uptick in crime, a lot of nuisance activity, a lot of vandalism, um, you know, a lot of transient type of activity, uh, you know, uptick in shoplifting, uh, had two arsons this year alone already. 
Um, so we're seeing a lot of type of activity that we don't normally um, see in the district. Um, and so we're focusing our efforts a little bit more on the security aspect of it. Uh, in the year coming up, we're gonna continue to reallocate funding towards security, um, just beefing that up and um, making sure the district is safe um, especially for any new residential projects that might come online. You know, obviously safety is a key uh, thing for residents in and around the district. Well, and also the city, of course. Um, so, in, so this year, you're going to see us pivot, you know, um, continue to pivot towards that security piece. Uh, we partner with our three surrounding county PBIDs, uh, Watt I-80, Antelope, and Carmichael who are also seeing some fairly um, significant increases in their activity. Right now, we're working on a project with the DA's office uh, to try and get the ban, uh, the moratorium on chronic offenders um, and zero bail uh, removed. Um, as we get you know, closer, we think maybe we, it, they've responded, the DA's office called each of us and so they were amenable to it. Um, Sue Frost is helping to push it also. Uh, so we think as we move you know, toward more vaccines, um, uh, the idea of that moratorium is, was to not overcrowd the jails uh, due to COVID. But some of us have chronic offenders that are being arrested 60, 70, 80 times, and it's just kind of a circular you know, they just get kicked right back out on the street and then there isn't a lot we can do. So we decided to kind of band together. Um, we share information, we share information on, on 602s, on who we're trespassing, who we're banning. We have a database that we share so we can see do we have cross traffic, um, just to kind of keep an eye on our real chronic, chronic offenders. Um, so that's something we're doing. I was happy to hear the DA's office called me this week and said they would be prosecuting a vandalism incident. And so this is good news. We don't always see that. Um, now this was a little bit bigger. They kicked in the doors of Walmart um, and that's about a six to $9,000 expense. So obviously it is a big expense. Um, I was happy to see them. That goes to trial April 5th. Um, so we think that's you know a good precedent that we start to kind of um, you know, prosecute some of these things that have just been kind of considered nuisance um, types of things. We're getting out our uniform uh, trespass, universal trespass form, been getting that to a lot of our uh, business and property owners, and we've gotten quite a few back. And that gives the Citrus Heights police uh, officer uh, the ability to ban on that owner's behalf. Uh, so that's been a really positive thing, and our businesses really like that. Um, and of course, the Citrus Heights Police Department um, partnership that we have is going really well. Um, we've seen a lot of success there. All the crime metrics are down in the district. So everyone's really happy with that. And uh, if we do renew, we look forward to continuing that. And then, of course, the other thing that we've been working on this year um, will be uh, PBID renewal, um, and of course we'll know in the next uh, three to four weeks whether we're going to make it. Um, right now we're about 75% of the way there. Um, we're waiting for the Garrity Group uh, Marketplace at Bird Cages petition, which has been sent out for signature and should be here next week, and that would put us at about 338,000. Um, our required threshold is 440,000. Um, so the only downside there is there aren't a lot of paths to that remaining 104,000 or so. Um, we've kind of, you know, on, on the one hand, we're doing very well with a lot of smaller business and property owners that sometimes we don't always get. I mean, obviously we try to get everyone. We want everyone to participate, of course and support the PBID, um, but we are getting a lot that I wouldn't have thought, um, even though we haven't been able to get in the past. Um, marketplace at Birdcage, for instance, sent in a no ballot last year. So that was a nice turnaround. Um, so there just aren't a lot of paths 
Um, without NAMDAR, NAMDAR's assessment is about 146,000. It's a very difficult number for us to make up. Um, uh, so, you know, we're, we're not going to give up. Natalie and I continue to work on it. Uh, the, no one's benefited more than Sunrise Mall, in my opinion, from the PBID over the many years, and especially this past year. Um, so we're going to continue to work on it. It does not look good. Um, and so we'll work some of those other uh, anchors, uh, Sears, Megan is reaching out, Sears helping me with that, uh, JC Penney's. Um, these can be difficult because I did send no ballots before. I would say if I had a concern, my biggest concern right now would be no ballots. The potential for no ballots from NAMDAR and the anchors would kill the bid. So I would say that's my main concern right now. Um, I don't know what you guys are seeing, but we're not getting all our mail and we're having like a really slow um, delivery with our mail. So I am a little concerned about the ballots. Um, so hopefully we can get those, you know, out early if we do make our threshold um, and give people plenty of time to get those ballots back in. Um, and as you know, that's a secret ballot process, so we don't know until that night. Um, so if you get some of those big no ballots, it can be very um, challenging to overcome. So, um, so we're remaining positive. We're working, you know, every, everyone. Um, and even if someone doesn't want to sign for the bid, um, when I talk to them, like Target, they recognize it's very beneficial. Um, some, it's just they don't have any investment in the local area. Um, so it's, they just hard for them to see the benefit. They just see this line on their uh, spreadsheet of all their stores. And, you know, and this one has this big 40 or $50,000 assessment, um, which are not keen on paying. So um, we continue to work it. Like I said, we'll know soon. Um, it's really up to them. My philosophy has always been, this is for the property owners and we, I don't have any skin in the game. Um, obviously we think it's been a very positive uh, benefit for the city and the district, but if they don't see the uh, benefit, you know, well, we can't make them and, it, and it's really up to them. So, you know, we try to promote it, but there's nothing we can do if they just don't see the benefit. Um, and, and, and that, it's their tax, it's their money, and that's just kind of how I look at it. Um, so also moving forward, we're going to, if we do renew, we'll roll out phase two of our masterpieces in the marketplace, um, which is our art wrap. You saw that downtown Sacramento was starting a big wrap program, so that was nice following on our heels. Um, and, you know, we're playing it by ear on events. Just, you know, gonna wait and see. Will things open up? We're supporting the Chamber's um, drive-in concert and sponsoring that. Um, we've been supporting and sponsoring the farmer's market. Um, so we're just kind of playing it by ear, see if we renew, see if things open up and we can start events again. Um, be looking for office space if we renew. Um, so those are some of the things. I think the things are looking up. Shoppers seem to be coming back. I went to both the Galleria and Fountains over the weekend. I was a little dismayed to see it was completely packed. <laughs> and I do mean like you couldn't even find a place to park, packed um, the entire mall. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see that many people. Um, I counted more than 80 people in line at the Disney store because it's closing. Um, so people are, you know, I think ready to get back out there and, and shop. Um, and we want them to be safe, of course, but, and hoping we, as you saw in the paper, hopefully we'll be in the orange tier in the next uh, three or four weeks, we're hoping. And I guess that's about all, if anyone has any questions. Well, thank you so much for your report. Uh, Kathy Lynn, are you getting all the support you need from the city on the renewal? Uh, yes. Sounds like oh, you're, yes. okay, good. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to yes. offer any help that we can do with that because oh, it's so yeah. important. Absolutely. You've done some great things with the PBID and uh, this year has been a tax on everybody. And I don't just mean monetary taxes. I mean, emotional and physical and everything. And you've been doing a great job supporting our businesses. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for everything you thank do. You. Thank you. And it, any questions from council? I have something. I'll, I'll go first, I guess. Go um, 
uh, Mayor made a very good point uh, that um, you know we have to make sure the city is doing everything we can on this. So, Kathy, I want to make sure I understand. Um, you've received ballots back at this point, and so even though you don't know who's a yes, who's a no, based on unless they've told you verbally, um, you do know who's returned ballots at this point and who hasn't. So we're still in the petition phase. So okay. um, the process is better. that we send out petitions. You don't have to send out a petition. If I don't think, you know, you don't have to send it. Not everybody has to get a petition. Okay. The city sends out the ballots once we make our threshold. If we don't make our threshold, we're done. Now, if we make our threshold, the city actually sends out the ballots. They're returned to the city and they're counted the night of the council meeting. Now, one okay, thing we've done in the past, which is helpful that the city could do to help, is we put a property owner ID on the outside of the envelope, and that at least tells us who sent it back. And we don't see the ballot, we don't look at the ballot, but we can say, well, okay, this one came back, oh, it's probably a no, you know, based on what we know. And we okay. can kind of track and say, oh my gosh, we better get, we better get on the phone. It looks like we've got a lot of no ballots coming in. Okay. And that, so from that, from that, my point was going to be that um, I, I know the mayor would be more than happy to jump in there, but we all have some limited time here and there, but I'm more than willing to jump in there. I'm sure other council members are willing to jump in there and to the extent that we're able to um, do some visits. And um, I think just uh, making sure that just it's reinforced more and more that the PBID area, the Sunrise Marketplace area is vibrant. It's alive. And it's that way a lot because of the P bid. And so they just have to recognize that, I think, to the point. I mean, nobody wants to pay extra. I wouldn't want to pay extra necessarily if I was uh, just a business owner. But if I understood the benefit of adding just a little bit in there by everybody, and then especially now that with the law enforcement, the dedicated law enforcement aspect is, is tremendous. And uh, I know I've heard good things about that. I think that will make a big difference the more and more that you know we go forward with that and so just having them understand and having that buy-in and saying you know that this might hurt right now but we're going to be opening up everything soon and you have to understand on the long-term basis that we will continue to survive and thrive up in the sunrise marketplace with the p bid without it it's questionable it's just questionable and so hopefully they'll see that and hopefully I'm choosing my words carefully with uh, the mall ownership and stuff like that, that they'll understand the benefit of working with you, working with us to make that happen uh, will be much more beneficial in their long-term you know, goals or whatever they do with that property than it would be um, without their support. Uh, there is just absolutely no reason for them not to support that, uh, support the PBID. So, you know, maybe they need to hear that in a different way, but they absolutely must support the PBID um, bottom line. Um, if, if they're gonna want to see, I think, the, the goodwill and, 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 you know, cooperation that we want to have with them also going forward with their property. So hopefully this works, it has to work um, because it's essential for that area. Thank you. That's and great. of course, we're always happy for any help. If you know anyone, uh, the local, you know, the local target manager, the local Lowe's manager, they're very, very supportive. Um, and as you guys know, Megan, Chris, calling you guys who work with, you know, the real estate people, they're just not terribly invested. Um, and some of these I have known of the same Larry Smith at Penny's, Tom Dawson at Target. Um, they're just not here. And they're just, they really don't care. Um, but I think, you know, there are some we might could pick up and Megan and I can brainstorm. You know, Lowe's is one that I think we can get a signature. It's finding the right person. And we've been hitting some block walls. The manager is trying to help us. Sometimes it's just finding the person who signs because these aren't people who are here locally. We've pretty much sewn up most of those. There are some small ones that we're working on. Um, but Target, Lowe's, Pennies, uh, Macy's, um, and then th these are just asset managers who they, they just don't really care. I mean, they just, they just don't care. And so it makes me nervous. Sometimes you're poking them just for them to send a no ballot. But 
Um, you know, we're going to try. We're, we're going to try. And anyone who wants to make a phone call or help, yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, you and, I us. Think, and I do think, um, Council Member Dennis, that NAMDARS indicated they're very, they are supportive of the bid. They do see the benefit um, of what we've done purchasing the Santa set and the tree. We did every bit of their interior COVID safety signage and we did every bit of their exterior. Uh, we're open signage. Um, we did the sneeze guards for the Easter, but I mean, we did the sneeze guards for that. We did the sneeze guards for the Santa. I mean, we, we've done a lot of stuff there. Well, we can't, we'll see if we can help them all see the value. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for uh, I Kathy? I have a brief comment, uh, Mayor. Uh, um, and I, I just want to express my gratitude to, um, to Kathy Lynn Carpenter and, uh, and her staff and um, Megan Huber for working so hard on this. We realize that uh, certainly there's a lot of questions that we that, that still remain uh, and, and we can hope that, uh, that everything comes together. But um, if it's all about the hard work, it'll go through, it'll, it'll be fine. Uh, because I can tell, and from uh, we've talked multiple times, um, and I, I know you guys are really working hard on this. So I just want to express gratitude that uh, that you are there and you are uh, really working hard to try to make this happen. So thank you. Thank you. If there's no other questions or comments, I'd like to thank you for your uh, annual report, Kathy Lynn Carpenter, and. Uh, Look forward to seeing you soon. And with that, can we call the next item, Ms. Van? The next item is presentation number five, a single mom strong program update. Hi there, I am Tara Taylor. I'm the founder of Single Mom Strong. Thank you for Welcome. the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, I requested this opportunity because we've been located in Citrus Heights for nearly two years. And yet for a year of that time, we've been operating obviously within the restricted parameters of the pandemic. So while I'm really proud of what we've built here, I recognize that you probably have no idea really what it is because you can't see it. Um, so I really wanted to just take a few moments to show you through pictures um, exactly who we are and what we do. And hopefully then you'll have a better idea of the resource that you have at your fingertips with Single Mom Strong in your community. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully we'll see how this goes. All right. You have it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> All right. So here we go. So the Empowerment Center is the building here located in Citrus Heights. Let's see if we can switch. Well, we might have gotten as lucky as we're going to get. There we go. Delayed. So our mission, our mission is to empower and create community for single mothers and their children through enrichment, encouragement, and educational programs. What does that mean? We do that first through creating community. So we have a variety of opportunities for our mothers and children to connect with each other, both live and in person in the center and through virtual opportunities. And this is a list of just a few, but the way that you can think of it is that every single week on rotation, there's some opportunity for our moms and children to connect and be part of something bigger. In addition to that, we um, provide the programming and services that remove obstacles and barriers to single mother success. So I will get into what those mean, but first our community events. So that four week rotation can easily be represented by these four items, mother and child events, mom's night out, support groups or clubs, and then the empowerment workshop. Now for our moms, we also have some annual events to take away the bigger burdens that happen throughout the year, such as back to school. A holiday can be very difficult on a single income. So Valentine's Day um, and the Christmas holiday, um, we support our families during those more challenging times for a single income household. In addition, our mother and child events create quality time um, spent between our mothers and children um, and really create opportunities for them to experience things they may not have the ability to afford on their own. 
We also have mom's night out. So it's the one time per month that mom gets to be an adult and share some uh, time with her peers. And then finally, our empowerment workshop. And our empowerment workshop is just an investment in our mom. It could be navigating the child support system, um, family law for custody battles, uh, anything that could also be a resource to them, like, like first time home buying or goal setting and accountability. So that's the community side. Now we switch to the programming side. And our first program I'll highlight for you is our men's mentoring team. So statistics, statistics tell us a lot about outcomes for children who don't have a male influence in their life. So what we've done is create a positive male influence that's consistently showing up for our kids. What happens is once a month while mom is in her workshop, our children are in the men's mentoring team activities. So small group activities with um, men who can consistently show up for our kids. Our next program is coaching, and we do a variety of coaching, um, pre-employment coaching, entrepreneurial coaching, career coaching. We have both executives, high-level executive volunteers who do our pre-employment program. I do life coaching specifically one-on-one -on -one with our single moms. And then career exploration is in development right now. And our career exploration program is giving our moms opportunities to look at industries that have low educational barriers, but high income potential. So moms, single moms typically get trapped in low wage jobs because of their circumstances. So we're introducing them to things like real estate, where there's flexible um, schedules, but not a huge education barrier and a huge upside in income. So those kinds of things to give them both um, guidance in getting into the industry and then the coaching and mentoring to get them really on their way. So that's the programming side. And our, our biggest component of our programming is our preschool and childcare. So one of the largest barriers to a single mother's success is access access to high quality preschool and child care that's affordable on a single income, you know, an average single income for a, for a single mother in Sacramento is $2,100 per month, but child care averages $874 per month. So how do you pay your rent? <laughs> it, the math doesn't add up, right? So we've created a program that allows our children or our mothers to volunteer for one hour a week and receive a tuition discount. In addition to that, we are the lowest priced, and I believe the highest quality, but the lowest price um, preschool and childcare program in the entire region. And we check that very regularly to make sure that that's the case. So for those moms who don't qualify for subsidy, subsidies, our single mom, strong moms, the ones that are making a little bit more than minimum wage and so they don't get the help anymore, we give them that middle range where they can volunteer, get that additional discount and afford to bring their child to a, a safe, um, high quality space. And then finally, this year, we added our tutoring program with your help. Um, we recognized that our children were suffering with distance learning. And so we've invited um, local high school seniors to work one-on-one -on -one with our kids to improve their outcomes in schooling this year. So as you can see, I hope the pictures gave you a good example of what exactly our village looks like. Um, and I just, again, want to thank you for your past support of our efforts and ask for your future collaboration. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I appreciate your time. I do have a big question for you. Yes. How does, how does a single mom find you? Where are oh, you at? singlemomstrong.org. Okay. Everything is on there. Um, but in addition to that, we are on Auburn and, and Pratt here in Citrus Heights. And we love our location because it's, you know, easy freeway access um, right on a, a major thoroughfare. So we love it here and, and we're hoping to can you, can continue to grow in this space. Good. Well, I'm glad we can help and thank you for all you do. Thank uh, you. Any other questions and comments? I have one. So Tara, what are the organizations are you collaborating with to get the, the word out about what you have to offer? 
That is such a good question. So I have a meeting uh, this week with Three Strands Global, but here's what I found is when we were very, very new, um, people didn't really understand what Single Mom Strong was. So we're a four-year-old organization. And so in those first couple of years in my excitement, I went literally door to door to all of these organizations because there's a lot of crisis intervention programs, but there's not a lot of next step what happens after the crisis. And that's what we are. We're a long-term resource. And so a program like St. John's or Women's Empowerment, those programs should be funneling their quote unquote graduates to someone like us. And so we're working on building those collaborations now. So if you have a connection to any of those programs, any of you, if you can open that door for us, we would be very grateful, but I've made it kind of my crusade to collaborate with as many women's organizations as possible. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions or comments? I got a quick quick uh, comment. Maybe a question might pop up here. So uh, uh, Tara, thank you. Uh, thank you for pre your presentation. You did a very good job here. Um, I happen to work with an organization. You probably know Michael Bell. Um, we are both involved in uh, Sacramento Valley Manufacturing Alliance. Yes. Uh, we would like to reach out to you and, um, and work with you to uh, we'd love to see more women in manufacturing, and uh, and that's a huge passion of mine. That uh, a couple of years ago, the mayor uh, wrote a proclamation to recognize uh, Manufacturing Month. So, certainly, would love to um, to collaborate with you further. Yes, that's actually <laughs> on our list. So, I'm very excited that you said that. Um, we would love to do that as well, and I'll definitely reach out. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, I'll go next. Uh, you know, I just want to say God bless you for what you're doing. Uh, this is something that is so extremely important in society today. There's, there's way, way, way too many single moms raising children on their own. And it, it's a shame. Um, and, you know, I have spoken to people in that position in the past who at times just kind of feel like they, they have nothing and nobody to, to, to turn to. And so, your organization is obviously something that people can turn to and it's wonderful. But I also want to just extremely commend you on the men's mentoring aspect of it. Um, that is uh, definitely missing from way too many children's lives. Um, we need men to step up. We need fathers to step up. But if they're not doing that and you know you have this program and you can connect uh, children, especially um, to positive male role models, I think that is extremely key to their future life uh, and, and survival and stuff like that. So thank you so much for having the, the foresight to include that as part of the program. Thank that you. sounds like a perfect bid to come volunteer. So I think, so. I, I think you just did. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be sure to reach back out. <laughs> thank I was you. thinking about my comments and I was thinking like, this lady's so on top of it. She's going to say that to me. Uh, I am an asker. You know what I will say, though, and, and thank you for that. Thank you for, for your perspective on that. And while I will say, agree with you that it is um, too large of a percentage of our population, of uh, you know, children being raised by single moms, I do also recognize that single moms have some qualities within them, their perseverance, their determination, their grit, their work ethic that we should be um, really harnessing. And so I think in addition to really um, solving the quote unquote problem, I think we can also create some really cool outcomes. And so I'm excited about that side of things as well. Cool, any other questions or comments? So we have a little cameo appearance over <laughs> in the Middleton household. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Tara, and thank you for the update. I appreciate it and we Thanks look forward for to working with you. Thanks again. Have a good night, you guys. All right. And with that, we're going to move on to uh, comments by council members and regional board updates. Uh, I guess that means uh, I need to pick somebody to go first. How about uh, council member Schaefer tonight? All right. So it's been a very busy time. Uh, let's see. Yesterday I had my orientation with SAC RT. Great group of people. Uh, really learned a lot. Uh, I know that I'm the alternate there and Steve, you're doing a great job on that board. Um, and I kind of told him, I said, well, you know, Steve told me that, you know, once in 15 years, I might actually show up to a meeting, but, uh, but nonetheless, great people to work with. Um, uh, Henry Lee is just, uh, just an amazing uh, person, uh, personality. 
Uh, also, uh, today I had uh, the library board uh, meeting, uh, which another great group of people, uh, some really uh, positive things going on with the library board. Um, the Oak Park looks like they're gonna, uh, they're gonna do a mini library. They're gonna, at least the planning is the, sort of they're sort of looking at a potential um, little mini library there that, uh, that really would be a, a great thing to see. Also, they're gonna be expanding the library into um, uh, the north area over in Natomas. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's some really positive things going on with the library board. Uh, we just like to get it up, up and open and um, and available to uh, to our patrons. So, uh, with that, that's uh, that's about all I had. Thank you, Tim. And with that, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Council Member Bruins. Thank you. Um, uh, Regional San met this week and um, uh, presented us with the annual reports for both Regional San and um, Sacramento Area Sewer District. And <laughs> excuse me. And uh, happy to report that both districts are being run very well. We do not anticipate any rate increases for the years to come. Um, in addition to that, we got a report on the Harvest Water Project, which is our ongoing project to reclaim our own water to use for irrigation purposes in our region. And uh, also a report on um, our uh, efforts to work with the county on some employment uh, contract updates. Uh, we are a unique depart a unique district in that, I think in the state of California, we're the only district where the um, employees work for the county and not for the district. And so that's something that we've been addressing for a while. And I served on a subcommittee uh, in regard to that as well. And that will be an ongoing issue um, uh, to address. The ultimate goal potentially would be for the uh, employment group to actually be employed by the district, not by the county. And there's a lot of, lot of uh, reasons why that would be good for the district and their employees. Uh, I also attended uh, the Chase uh, Area 7 and 8 meeting last week, right after our strategic planning meeting. That evening, I gave a report out on that to that area. Uh, area 9 has been meeting with them as well. And they formally voted to combine areas seven and eight with area nine. Their boards have voted on it and approved it. So it's now going to be called Chasen to add the N for nine. And their uh, next step is to update their bylaws to reflect this change. And that's, uh, they're working on that. And I, I've got to commend Kathy Morris and um, Mike Nishimura the respective presidents of those neighborhood associations for the good work that they've done um, and keeping their um, connection to the people in their neighborhoods during the whole COVID year that we've experienced. And then finally, just a real brief uh, notice that I, we had a finance committee meeting today and took a first look at the, the budget, which will be presented th through a budget workshop um, in the next few weeks and um, our community support funding. So that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Council Member Daniels, what have you been up to? Thank you. I uh, did have an air board meeting this morning. A um, Couple of things came out of it. The main thing that I was hoping to share tonight, um, uh, and I'll just kind of uh, re repeat the words today, but I was hoping to get a, a more formal um, document from them, uh, but when it comes in, I'll share it uh, through social media and see if we can get it on the uh, website of the city. Uh, it's about a program where um, you can trade in, I shouldn't use trade in, maybe turn in your old clunker. Um, and it has to be, it be, I believe, 15 years or older and receive up to $9,500 towards a, an electric vehicle. Um, and that depends on your level of income, you know, with your number in your family and all of that stuff. But um, it, it's considered a low income program, but on the guidelines, that is, uh, you can be a family of four making $60,000 or more and still qualify for that. And so there's a sliding scale on how much you can get based on that income and whatnot. But I want to get that out soon because one of the things with the Air Board is even though that's a regional board, 
it tends to be that the dollars that come into that, which also come from us and Folsom and areas around here, we don't tend to see a direct uh, return on those dollars. We get the indirect, obviously, because the air goes anywhere it wants to go and, and, and the effort is to keep it clean. But usually the, the, the programs and the, the assets and stuff like that from the district tend to be more in the South Sacramento and city area and stuff like that. So this is an opportunity maybe for our residents to, to get a more direct benefit um, uh, for what we do at the Air Board. But I'll get that out there. Um, I think that's a, a great opportunity. And, uh, and just to finalize it, that money doesn't have to be the full cost of the vehicle. You could purchase like a $15,000 vehicle and put that $9,500 towards it. So that makes it much more affordable than for uh, a family that uh, is within those guidelines. And so uh, hopefully I'll get that up again on uh, social media and maybe see if the, the city can put it on the Facebook, excuse me, on their well Facebook page and, and website and, and get that information out as quickly as possible. Um, really, really, really happy to see schools open, to see our kids in the San Juan district back to school. Um, I, I'm not real happy with the, um, the two days a week, two and a half hours. I, I think that's in, insufficient, but it's a step in that direction. And so hopefully that'll change quickly and we'll see kids back for at least four days a week. But um, just, you know, we can't underscore how, uh, how good it is to have our kids back in school. So hopefully that, that will continue to grow and, uh, and we'll see kids back, you know, 100% full-time by the fall, I would hope. And then the final thing is regarding kids, um, my wife has given me uh, specific instructions to make sure that I tell my little daughter, Savannah, that I love her very much and that I'll see her in a little bit. That's it. Thank you, Brett. Vice Mayor Middleton. Thank you, Mayor. So this past two weeks, meetings have been pretty slow, so not a lot to report back. So I spent a lot of my time doing good deeds in our community. Uh, since kids were going back to school, I donated 14 haircuts to Single Mom Strong and to the Underground, Children, uh, underground Clothing Store in Sunrise Mall to help our youth. Um, I'm really excited that our kids are back in school. It's a short amount of time, but I'm enjoying all the extra free time I have. I also delivered Girl Scout cookies. I'm on a diet. I bought a case, I didn't eat them. I did not eat a single one, very proud of myself for that. But I did spread them around um, our community center and uh, around uh, the PD. to just let everyone know that I appreciate everything that's going on. We've all done a really great job of maintaining our connectivity and just being really resilient through all this. And I'm looking forward to the point where we're actually back in person. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Portia. Well, my turn and uh, I'll try and be quick on this, but uh, uh, Councilmember Bruins mentioned that uh, we held our strategic planning workshop on Tuesday, March 16th. And I did wanna just quickly touch on our three-year goals. Uh, every three years we established new goals, it was time. Um, and then what we do is establish tasks for those goals within the next six months. So we focus staff in on what we wanna do to achieve those goals, but it's, with, with, it's simple tasks within six months. I'm not gonna read all the tasks, um, this year was very important, though, because we missed a whole year, two strategic planning meetings during the uh, COVID shutdown. So I just wanted to reiterate our three-year goals for 2021 to 2024, uh, and they're not in priority order. They're, we feel they're all equal in value. Uh, maintain and enhance fiscal stability. Second goal was maintain public infrastructure and enhance alternative modes of transportation. The next goal was diversify for a resilient economy. And the fourth goal was sustain and preserve public safety. And the last one was enhance community vibrancy and engagement. Now, if you'd like to see the tasks that we've established for the next six months or more information on the workshop, including some of the exercises we did where we did a uh, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat analysis for the city, uh, there's some good information there. And I did look to see if it's on our website. I promise you by Monday, it'll be there. Uh, I think it has the October 22nd, 2019, which was the last time we did this. So we'll have the uh, complete package for you uh, on the website, uh, probably tomorrow now that I've said something, but I guarantee by Monday. Um, and I uh, had a few meetings. I did, uh, Jeannie and I were in the uh, finance committee meeting where we talked about the uh, uh, budget and uh, the preliminary budget for uh, 
21, 22, and 22, 23, the uh, uh, CIP program, which is capital improvement program, community funding. Uh, and you'll all see that uh, in a workshop, the, the first meeting, I think that's April 8th. Um, also with uh, Vice Mayor Middleton, we, we attended a meeting yesterday on bird scooter and uh, I'm sure uh, staff will be bringing more information to the uh, council and uh, I will reserve my, my thoughts on that till then. And with that, I'd like to move on to the next agenda item. Next agenda item is our public comment and members of the public may address the council on any item of interest to the public and within the council's purview or on any agenda item before or during the council's consideration of the item. Speakers will be limited to three minutes each. If you wish to address the council during the Zoom meeting, please use the raise hand function or star nine from a telephone to indicate your desire to speak. Um, at this time, I do not have any written comments um, and I do not see any, uh, actually, I do see one uh, raised hand um, from the telephone number ending in 7640. And so I will allow them to uh, speak for three minutes. So go ahead, you can speak on the telephone. Do you hear me? If you are you able to unmute your telephone? I'm sorry, try again. Are you able to unmute your phone? We can hear you now. You can hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor, uh, I would like to ask uh, for, uh, I heard this today uh, on, on the, on the news that uh, I uh, heard like uh, the, the gal from the marketplace mentioned something about mail, but I wanted to let you know that they're speaking about only having mail, only either it's not uh, secure yet, but they're going to have, have uh, maybe have mail just once a week and then again, maybe just uh, twice a week, and then like have postage go up. And that's from what I know right now. And that's what it was said on over the news. Thanks for bringing that to attention, Arthur. Um, I'm not completely sure of the details, so we'll have to uh, stay tuned and see what the uh, US Postal Service has to say. Yes, they, they said that if they don't do it, that they, they will be going broke uh, uh, within about two years is what they said because they're in a deficit that like where from the the amount of what uh, what's uh, of what they have so that's about all that I know uh, mayor well thank you Arthur Appreciate you dialing in and taking your time to, to let us know. All right, are there any other comments? I do not see any other raised hands at this time. Okay, then let's move on to the next item or items. And next item is consent calendar items six and seven. Of approval. I second. second. Okay, didn't hear the, who, who did the second? So there's a motion by Councilmember Schaefer, second by 
I think Brett. Okay, well, Brett, will you take the second? Sure. <laughs> and the fifth? <laughs> uh, please call the roll. Council Member Bruins? Aye. Council Member Daniels? Aye. Council Member Schaefer? Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton? Aye. And Mayor Miller? Aye. So the consent calendar passes unanimously and on to public hearings. Public hearing number eight. This subject is consolidated annual performance evaluation report to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development on program year 2020 community development block grant funds. The recommendation is to hear a public hearing on the item and adopt a resolution approving the consolidated annual performance evaluation report for program year 2020. Good evening, Mayor Miller, Vice Mayor Middleton, Stephanie Cotter, Community Development Department. Tonight, I'm here to provide you um, with a review of our CAPER report or the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. This is required by HUD um, and it's a review of all of the community development block grant program activities that were completed within the 2020 program year. And in CDBG terms, um, the program year is January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. The city um, completed all of the public participation requirements um, that HUD uh, uh, mandates the city to do. We posted it um, in the Sacramento Bee and notice, and then we posted the actual plan on the city's website and in other places. Um, as designated in our citizen participation plan. Tonight is the public hearing, and then we will incorporate all of the public comments received through March 30th when we submit the final report to HUD. In program year 2020, the city received about $639,000 in um, annual CDBG funds. In addition to that, the city also received a one-time allocation of CV or coronavirus funding in the amount of about $376,000. The funding, the CV funding isn't restricted to the 2020 program year. The city has um, about three years to use most of the funding and then all of the funding has to be spent within five years. We also received almost $50,000 in loan payments for um, total revenue of of just over a million dollars. The biggest expenditure for CDBG in 2020 was the accessibility and drainage improvement project. We were really lucky um, that we were able to give so much money to public services this year as a result of the um, CV funding the city received and the city council awarded um, all of that funding to public services. We um, spend CDBG funds on planning and administration, which reimburses uh, the general fund for any staff time that's spent worked on CDBG activities. Um, this also includes police department staff time for working on the Navigator Fund. And the projects that are italicized um, because of COVID and, and various reasons, they weren't able to start um, in 2020, but they are underway currently. So. They didn't have any expenditures um, by the end of the calendar year, but they are still continuing. So the 2020 public services, uh, we really offered a wide range of services. The Sunrise Christian Food Ministry had their emergency food closet. Campus Life offered the after school program. And then when that was closed, they distributed meals to families. Meals on Wheels delivered meals to seniors. Sacramento self help housing, um, they're the ones who staff our homeless navigator position, and they also provide our renters helpline service, which um, helps residents of Sacramento County with any fair housing or tenant landlord issues. And finally, Leave um, is another nonprofit the city works with, and they provide services for households that are affected by domestic violence. So in partnership with our nonprofits, the city was able to serve over 13,000 households um, with CDBG funded services in 2020. 
This is a snapshot of the public service expenditures for 2020, um, including the regular CDBG award, um, the CV award, and um, the amount they expended from that and the amount remaining. So the remaining amounts are from the CV funded activities because they have more than a year to use those funds. So they're continuing to use those into 2021. Our biggest capital project, the Accessibility and Drainage Improvement Project was completed this year. Um, and you can see a before and after picture there. Obviously the after is on the right, it looks a lot nicer. Um, and the CDBG funds are able, we're able to use those to leverage our stormwater funds. Um, so when General Services Department goes out and selects the um, locations to do the improvements for the drainage improvements, we go through and we see which would also be good candidates for CDBG um, funds, which would be accessibility improvements or any public improvements, as long as it's in a, a low or moderate income census block. The Supplemental Navigator Fund um, was another one of our largest activities of 2020. And I'm gonna provide just a brief overview of the activity. And then Sergeant Seth Semino is here and he's gonna provide um, a little bit of an update on um, their uh, success so far. So the city council, out, you allocated $125,000 in special CV funding, in addition to the $16,000 that we use annually um, to fund the navigator position, the salary. Um, the navigator fund, which is accessible to our navigator, and provides temporary housing like a motel or sober living, um, food and laundry vouchers to those clients who are receiving housing um, to remove barriers and really help them um, get into permanent housing. We also will use this fund to provide security deposit assistance when somebody has successfully gotten through the program and they're ready to um, obtain permanent housing, but the only barrier is the security deposit, and we will provide that as well. And because of the CDBG guidelines, clients can only be assisted for a maximum of six months. So now I will turn it over to Sergeant Semino to provide an update. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Seth Semino. I'm a sergeant with the police department. I have the privilege to lead our special operations unit. Special operations consist of our problem-oriented policing team, code enforcement, rental housing inspection, animal services, and our homeless navigator program and our homeless navigator, Tony Morgan. I'd like to spend a few minutes and take a look at the slide that we have here for you. This is a 2020 snapshot for you, an update on our navigator program moving forward. The first bullet point that we see our total clients served 218 by our homeless navigator in 2020. She is currently working with 34 of those clients and was able to house 106 clients during the year 2020. The next bullet point you see is 78 that we've lost contact with. And there are a few things that could come into play on that. They've moved out of the area, we're unable to locate them or they've re or refused services from our navigator. I wanna focus on the number 106, which is the number of clients that were housed last year and break that down for you. Through our CDBG grant funding, through the motel and through Grace House, we were able to house 22 clients, eight other, I'm sorry, 10 other clients. We were able to house at other recovery centers throughout the region. We were able to house four veterans and assist 70 other clients with other housing. Stephanie had just made mention in regards to uh, security deposits is one way through private rentals and also reuniting them with family or friends who can assist them as well with housing. The last bullet point on the slide is meals provided through CDBG funding, which was 255. We had many successes over the year 2020. I'd like to highlight just one of them for you. I spoke with our navigator and asked, if she could pick one, which one would be the best? In early 2020, our navigator came into contact with a young man here in the city of Citrus Heights who had been uh, homeless on our streets for five years, self-admitted substance abuser, and, and he had hit rock bottom. He was at rock bottom. 
Our navigator, Tony Morgan, through her expertise, care and compassion, scooped him up. We put him in a hotel for a week as we uh, were waiting for a bed to be ready for him at the Grace House. He successfully completed a six month recovery program at the Grace House where they assisted him in transitioning or transferring into transitional housing. The praise report or the good news, he has a full-time job in our community now, which is awesome. He's saving up money to buy his first car, hopefully next month. And I think the most important thing, we can really see the great success is he's been clean and sober for nine months and is an incredible advocate for the program as a whole with some of our other homeless individuals in the city of Citrus Heights. So thank you guys very much for your time. It's been a privilege. Your time is valuable. I appreciate you lending a few minutes to me. I'm here to field any questions or if you have any comments, thank you very much. Any questions or comments from council? If wonderful, not, we'll- Wonderful work. Yes, we'll keep moving on. Great, and I'll turn it back. Sorry, I, I thought I was unmuted. This is Janie. Um, just want to thank you for your report and just acknowledge the work that you and your team and Tony have done in light of tremendous challenges this, this year. It's just a testimony to the ongoing success and what can happen with um, an ongoing effort to, to address the uh, issue of homelessness. So thank you very much, uh, Sergeant Camino. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. I appreciate it. I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Sergeant Cimino. Um, so I'll just wrap up with a quick preview of activities that are currently underway or will be starting soon for the 2021 CDBG program year. Um, so this is the action plan that you approved in November and then the program year started in January. We do have a few projects that are continuing over from um, 2020. So we've got public services planned, um, a wide variety, our normal public services, plus the addition of single mom strong this year, which we're very excited about. Um, the San Juan restroom replacement project, which is our partnership with the park district um, and was part of our deal to transfer Sinar neighborhood park. Um, this was the last park improvement that we agreed to. So they have selected San Juan park and we'll be replacing the restroom. Um, it's in progress right now. The critical repair grant program, the contract was awarded and they're currently working with participants. Um, so we will be awarding um, some more grants this year and also working with the general services department on the signalized intersection improvement project and then the next annual accessibility and drainage improvement project. Um, we also are always working on our housing repair loan program. That is something that is ongoing um, and is funded with loan payments as we receive them. So I don't have anything else besides the public hearing, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions before I open up the public uh, hearing? Sure. Hearing none? Okay, hold on and we'll take some, uh, take public comment on the, I'll open the public hearing. And uh, are there any hands raised, Amy, or public comment coming our way? I do not have any written public comment for this item and I do not see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. With that, I'll close the public hearing and uh, Council Member Schaefer, you had a yeah, to say. Uh, well done, Stephanie. Uh, great job in your report uh, and I appreciate the, um, the, the, the support from, um, from Sergeant Cimino. Uh, well done uh, and, uh, and I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Member Schaefer. So I'm, I move that we um, issue a resolution of the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights um, approving the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report for Program Year 2020. Second. Motion by Bruins. Second. Second by Middleton. Please call the roll. Ms. Van. Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels? Aye. Councilmember Schaefer? Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton? Aye. And Mayor Miller? Aye. Okay, on to the regular calendar, please.
Regular calendar item number nine, the subject is general plan annual progress report. The recommendation is to adopt a resolution accepting the 2020 general plan annual progress report. Good evening, council members. Um, my name is Eric Singer. I'm the assistant planner with the planning department. And as Amy said, I'll be presenting on the 2020 general plan annual progress report. As a very brief overview, the general plan has a number of comprehensive long-term goals that the city is hoping to achieve over a long, uh, usually 20 year time horizon. And the purpose of the annual progress report is to highlight any significant progress that's been made toward those specific goals uh, during the reporting year, in this case, 2020, obviously. Uh, an additional purpose of the APR is to provide an update to HCD uh, on any progress that's been made uh, toward reaching our regional housing needs allocation goals. So looking at 2020, um, specifically uh, progress made towards housing development, uh, we did not receive any housing development applications in calendar year 2020. However, we did approve two applications uh, totaling 118 units. Uh, the majority of those units were considered uh, very low income which is a, an important distinction to make towards achieving our arena goals as it took us about 90% of the way to uh, reaching our arena number in that particular category. Uh, in addition to the entitlements, we issued 139 housing units uh, with building permits. Um, some of those were for the same projects that had been entitled in 2020. Um, and lastly, we issued six certificates of occupancy um, which was a fairly low number, but we expect that uh, a good number of the units that have been issued permits in 2020 will also be receiving certificates of occupancy in 2021. So looking at a few of the projects that are responsible for those numbers, um, obviously you're all very familiar with the Mitchell Farms subdivision as well as the Northridge Grove or uh, Abbey's Gate is now what it's called uh, subdivision. Those were both issued uh, a fairly sizable chunk of building permits. So construction is, is uh, proceeding very nicely on both of those developments. Additionally, the Fair Oaks Senior Apartment Complex was both entitled as well as issued building permits in the same calendar year. Uh, that's the 110 very low income units. Um, in addition to that, the Auburn Heights Small Lot Subdivision was entitled, that was eight additional units. Uh, and it was interesting in that it was the first of its kind since Zoning code changes uh, allowed for this type of a development to occur with more units on a parcel that would otherwise be undersized. Last but not least, uh, an important development in the um, Carefield Senior Living Facility was approved. And although those units do not count towards our arena numbers, it's still an important development in terms of creating housing opportunities for all segments of the community. Another goal that saw significant progress in 2020 was the, the continuing development of the Sunrise Mall specific plan. Um, two very important public events were held in 2020. The first of which was the open house um, in February that was uh, pre-pandemic. So it was done in person at the Sears uh, on site and had a very robust turnout with, with great feedback from the public. Uh, on the heels of that and as a result of the pandemic, uh, the city had to pivot into doing an online virtual workshop in June um, that yielded again very good public uh, response and much of that response has been used in um, crafting the Sunrise Mall specific plan and, that will hopefully uh, be going forward uh, this calendar year. Additionally, uh, a number of uh, goals were, were saw significant progress in terms of infrastructure. Uh, these include the Auburn Boulevard Complete Streets Plan uh, Phase 2. A consultant contract was issued uh, for the final design and right-of-way coordination uh, in March of last year, and currently the final design is underway. Uh, the Old Auburn Road Complete Streets Plan, or ORCS for short, uh, was adopted by this body in March of last year, including the preferred concept for the plan. Uh, and lastly, the MMTSP, as well as the Carriage Lobby Safe Routes to School Plan, were both adopted uh, by this body in December of last year. Uh, the implementation for the MMTSP is anticipated to occur in spring of uh, 2021 this year. 
And lastly, uh, and very importantly, in addition to the many great accomplishments that Sergeant Semino had spoken about earlier, um, another great accomplishment on the side of public safety is the continued success of the Rental Housing Inspection Program. Uh, so to date, since its inception in 2019, this program has been responsible for over 3,600 housing units and over 5,800 uh, housing violations being identified. This goes quite a long way in helping to, um, excuse me, it has the potential to uh, identify any hazards that could result in great bodily harm or death. So these really impressive results are just highlighting and underscoring the need and importance of having a program dedicated to improving the city's rental housing. So we applaud the CHPD and code enforcement and their continued efforts in that regard. So this is staff's uh, recommended action to council and I am available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Singer? Uh, nice report, by the way, thank you. So I just, uh, this is Jeannie. Um, it sounds as though on the riddle, uh, uh, flip, flip the slide back one, if you would, please. Um, yeah, the rental housing inspection program that we have some violators that have multiple violations on their property. Is that a fair assessment? I would let uh, Sergeant Semino probably speak to the specifics of um, the frequency of, of, you know, individual property owners having repeat offenses. I would not be surprised if that was the case, but I can't speak with any specific knowledge to that. Or just different, multiple different types of violations, I'm thinking. Might be I, I believe that is the case, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your report. It was a good one. Thank you. And if there's no other questions for Eric, I would uh, entertain a motion. So I move that we accept the 2020, the, uh, that we adopt a resolution to accept the 2020 general plan annual progress report and direct staff to forward the report to the appropriate state agencies in accordance with government code section 65400. Seconded. Thank you, Jeannie. Motion by Bruins, second by Schaefer. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton. Aye. Mayor Miller. Aye. And that item carries unanimously. Next item, please. Department reports number 10. The subject is overview of the permit ready accessory dwelling unit program and a presentation will be given by the community development department. Good evening council, Allison Bermudez here with the planning division. So happy to present this program to you tonight. Uh, we are calling it PRADU or permit ready accessory dwelling unit program. Uh, the permit ready program will provide um, permit ready plans to Citrus Heights property owners wishing to develop an ADU on their property. Um, so an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit, um, formerly called secondary unit, uh, granny flat in law quarters. Um, they're now rephrased as an ADU. Their popularity, popularity has continued to increase uh, since legislation uh, really changed some of the requirements back in 2017. Every year we have seen our permit uh, requests almost double um, for this type of living unit. It really does provide uh, property owners a way to increase housing on their property for family members um, without the purchase of having, without the need to purchase land. Um, so we feel this program will really um, serve a need for our community um, for the requests for ADUs. Currently, if you propose to build an ADU on your property, you have to hire an architect and a designer. You have to prepare your plan review, plan check, um, all costing money and time. This program will have some predefined designs and sizes. And should one of those fit the property owner's needs, they have access to these plans at no cost. Um, and it's very exciting. We're going to have three different options available. We're going to have a studio model, a one one, and then a two bedroom, one bath unit. Uh, these plans will 
tiles, but with exterior finishes and different roof designs. Uh, there'll be 13 models to choose from. The units will also feature um, wider doorways and hallways to meet accessibility requirements. As many of the units that we have found, um, you know, are occupied by our senior citizens or elderly family members. I did want to mention this program is, has been fully funded um, by for and received last year. The LEAP grant was provided by the Community Housing Development Department of the state. And so a portion of that award has been used to create this program. Here's a sneak peek at some of the designs of the units. This is the studio unit and one of the chosen roof lines. Uh, lots of windows and a covered porch. Um, so this is, will be one available style. This is the uh, one one unit with its exterior options. And then the two one option. So very complementary to our local architecture and um, meet the neighborhoods that we have around here. I feel the architecture will really blend in and be a compliment. Um, we should have these plans back and ready for the community to use early summer. They have been created um, by our selected vendor um, and are about ready to go through the plan check. And once the building department does their overall plan check, then we'll be releasing them for the public to start using. So we're hoping in 60 days or so these will be available. Um, some of the plans we have to roll the program out, we're gonna do a pretty extensive media campaign. We're gonna create some videos that, to be shared and on the website that will help guide people towards the use of this program. Not only these specific plans, but for ADU development um, in general. And then we will host a community webinar um, in the future where people can attend to learn more specifics about the development of their ADU. More information on ADUs in general and the program will is published on our website, uh, which can be reached through citrusheights.net slash ADU central. So thank you for the time. I'm very excited for this program. It's been a long want of the community development department and the Grant funding really helped us um, get this going. And we're really the first one in our area to do, to roll out this program, even though there are other jurisdictions that do it. We're certainly not unique in that, but um, we are ahead of the game for our area. So very excited about that. If you have any questions, let me know. Or if you meet anyone interested in ADUs, please feel free to send them my way. I'd be happy to help them. Thank you, Allison. Great program, great presentation. Uh, I love the idea of uh, making it inexpensive to to build uh, what we used to call a, a grandma flat, but now I guess uh, it can be for any use, even even a renter these days. So it's fantastic news. Glad to see it come together. Any questions for or comments for Allison? I have a couple. Allison, what are the um, what's this range in square footage between the smallest to the largest of these? I think we lost Allison. I, did we lose Allison? Yeah. Um, I want to say, Casey, help me out. 600 Believe to 750. Does that sound about right? Well, that's a small, but yeah, then it goes, all, I think it goes all the way up to 1800 if I remember correctly. Okay. For the two bedroom one up to 1800. So that's, I a believe sizable, that's a sizable house. That's bigger than my four bedroom house. <laughs> um, the, are these, so these are, um, um, Typical, typical construction dwellings are not prefab, you know. Correct. Correct. Okay. And and then what is the uh, the minimum lot size you could have, like as far as an RD five, the zoning RD five, RD eight, to put one on these. There's been a lot of changes over the years, and a lot of the old requirements that you may be familiar with have, have gone out, gone away um, by by the state. They have, and we've updated our zoning code to reflect that. So there's not really minimum lot sizes, and the setbacks have been greatly reduced. And even multifamily can have ADUs now. So that it's it's really oh. really um, opened up to to a lot of more opportunity throughout the city. Right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. It's a great report. It's a good opportunity for the uh, community, I think. It's great. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. 
Well, good, thank you for the presentation. On to the next item, please. Next item is city manager items. Not this evening, thank you, council. Okay. Next item is items requested by council members or future agenda items. Let me just say, first of all, I need to apologize to our city staff. I realized after I said it about not being on the website for our strategic plan, that everybody agreed that I would announce it publicly first and then we put it on the website so that it didn't get out before I announced it. So again, apologies to everybody all around. And with that, any other items requested by council members or future agenda items? And not hearing any, is that all the business we have, Amy? Yes, that is correct. Then we are stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night.